Welcome to the History Program, a monthly series of programs produced by the Franciscans of the Immaculate for Gate of Heaven Radio. In this series, we will be looking at events in history, famous people in history, including saints and blesseds, foundations of religious orders, and much more. In short, anything in history that has a Catholic perspective. Our objective will be to tell you the facts as recorded by history. We will not be entering into polemics nor aiming to generate any controversy. If we venture an opinion, we will say so. You are free to agree or disagree. This month's programme is entitled St John Wall and the Penal Times. Before I was assigned to Australia, I lived for about five years in our various houses in England, most of that time being spent in the city of Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. Our parish in Stoke was part of the Archdiocese of Birmingham. On one occasion, the community went on a pilgrimage to Harvington Hall in Worcestershire, a magnificent, magnificent medieval manor house still surrounded by a moat. This house was acquired by the Archdiocese in 1923. The house had been in the hands of Catholic noble families, and during the penal times, hiding holes were built into the house to hide priests from the persecuting authorities. One of the priests associated with the house was a Franciscan priest, St. John Wall, who gave up his life for the faith and is numbered amongst the 40 martyrs of England and Wales canonised by Pope Blessed Paul VI in 1970. We will take a closer look at the life of St. John Wall in a moment. But first, let me explain briefly what were the penal times. Listeners may recall King Henry VIII and how he broke from the Catholic Church by setting himself up as head of the Church in England all because the Pope refused to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. A widespread confiscation and destruction of church property followed, and many were martyred. We will not go into the details of that in this programme. On Henry's death, his son Edward became king. His reign was short-lived, but the persecution intensified. Additional laws against Catholics were enacted, and the Anglican religion was formally established. On her ascension to the throne, Henry's daughter Mary restored the Catholic faith. However, her reign was also short-lived, and the restoration ended on her death. The persecution against the Catholic faith became even worse under Mary's successor, her half-sister Elizabeth, with the enactment of further laws. For example, the death penalty was imposed for a seminary priest or a Jesuit found in the country, and also for those who assisted a priest or gave him shelter. And as we shall see in the case of St. John Wall, the persecutors were not content just to kill their victims. These laws, known as the penal laws, were relaxed a little in the late 18th century and in 1829, the Catholic Emancipation Act was passed. So, after that brief summary, let us take a look at the holy life and the holy death of St. John Wall. John Wall was of a noble Catholic family. His family had kept the faith and suffered persecution as a result. They were forced to leave their original home in Norfolk, in England, to escape the persecution, moving to a safer environment in Lancashire, where Catholics were more numerous. It was probably in Lancashire that John was born in 1620. Four years later, after John's birth, a second son, William, was born. He would also become a priest, and in later years a Benedictine monk. He would also suffer persecution, but not death, for the faith. It is interesting to note that John was baptised by Father Edmund Arrowsmith. 
Father Arrow Smith was also to give up his life for the faith and is numbered amongst 40 martyrs of England and Wales, canonised in 1970. By the way, if you were visiting the Preston area in Lancashire, you can venerate the relic of St Edmund's arm at the Church of St Oswald and St Edmund Arrowsmith in the town of Ashton in Makerfield. But back to John Wall. Even as a boy, John was known for his virtue. And when he was old enough, he was sent to the English College in Dewey, the seminary that spawned many future martyrs. Incidentally, it was at this college that the Old Testament was translated from the Latin Vulgate into the English language in 1609, one half of the famous Dewey Rheims Bible. In 1641, he went on to Rome to study philosophy and theology at the Venerable English College. And it was in Rome on the 3rd of December 1645 that he was ordained a priest. Around the same time his brother William arrived in Rome and was admitted as a student. Father John Wall remained in Rome for further studies for another three years. Dom Bede Cam a Benedictine priest, wrote a booklet early in the last century entitled The Life of St. John Wall. In it he writes that our martyr had a very tender devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Father Wall departed for England in 1648. The records of the Venerable English College note Out of his particular devotion to our Blessed Lady, he would go by Loretto. Accordingly, putting a pilgrim's weed over his scholar's habit, and with staff in hand, he began his journey towards the Holy House. The Father Minister and Confessor, with six scholars, accompanied him part of the way, and then took leave of him. He went the rest of the journey alone. On his way back to England, he stopped at Dewey and may have visited the Franciscan friary there. It was at this friary that he would soon take the religious habit. He did not spend long in England, returning to Dewey in 1650. There he entered the Franciscan order, receiving the name and religion of Brother Joachim of St. Anne, after the parents of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Interestingly, the Franciscan Friary in Dewey was founded by Father John Jennings, the brother of the martyr St. Edmund Jennings, who was also numbered amongst the 40 martyrs of England and Wales. In 1656, Father John Wall, the Franciscan priest, was sent to the English mission, where he would spend a total of 23 years labouring in the vineyard until his capture and arrest. His brother William was also ordained a priest and was sent to the English mission in 1652. Eighteen years later, he would enter the, enter the Benedictine order. As we have already noted, he would suffer persecution, but not death, for the faith. Father John Wall lived in and carried out his priestly ministry from various manor houses, mostly in the Warwickshire, Worcestershire area. These manor houses belonged to Catholic recusant families. Recusant being a word we use to describe families who kept the faith during those penal times. But it was Harvington Hall, home of the Yate family, that he would spend most of his time, a total of 12 years. From here, Father John Wall would visit his penitents and catechise them in their own homes. He did his best to bring back into the Catholic fold those who had strayed away. Let us go forward to the year 1678. This was the year of the so-called Popish Plot, 
but more properly called the Titus Oates plot. The gist of the affair was that there was a plot by Catholics, in particular Jesuits, to assassinate the king, subvert the government and destroy the Protestant religion. The whole thing was a fabrication by Oates and other people from start to finish. There is no need to spend time delving into who Titus Oates was. Suffice to say that even long before 1678 he had a record for perjury. Indeed, during his college days a fellow student noted that Oates was the most illiterate dunce incapable of improvement. How prophetic. A wave of hatred and persecution began against Catholics. Many innocent people were put to death, including the Holy Archbishop of Armagh, Oliver Plunkett, canonised in 1975. Regarding the plot itself, the historian Hilaire Belloc writes that at the time of the Oates plot, perhaps one-eighth of the population of England was still openly Catholic, and maybe another one-eighth sympathetic. Remember, this was well over a century after the prohibition of the Catholic faith. Mr. Belloc writes that it was the final and mortal blow from which English Catholicism never recovered, and that by 1780, one family in a hundred at the most kept up a sort of nominal Catholicism by tradition. It took a famine in Ireland and a subsequent mass immigration of poor Irish immigrants into the industrial towns of England during the middle of the 19th century to bring about a serious growth and revival of the Catholic faith in England. But let us return to Father John Wall. He was in London when the, when the Oates plot broke out. London being the centre of the anti-Catholic frenzy, Father Wall escaped and took refuge in Rushock Court, home of the Catholic Finch family, not far from Harvington Hall. He was arrested a month later. He was ordered to take the infamous oaths of supremacy and allegiance. Firstly, let us remind ourselves briefly of what these oaths consisted. The oath of supremacy was enacted during the reign of King Henry VIII and obliged a person to swear that the English sovereign was head of the church in England. The oath of allegiance was enacted during the reign of King James I as an additional penal measure to persecute Catholics. The Pope condemned it, declaring that it cannot be taken as it contains many things evidently contrary to faith and salvation. Thus, no Catholic could take either of these oaths, and of course, Father John Wall refused to do so. Father Wall spent most of his time in custody at Worcester Castle, already in those days a cold, damp ruin of a place. Father Wall was happy to declare himself a faithful subject of the king, but he would not swear anything against his faith or his conscience. His persecutors also suspected him of being a priest, but Father Wall let them go on to prove their case against him. On this matter, let us quote from Father Calm's booklet. If any should be tempted to feel that in concealing his priesthood at the trial, Father Wall seemed to fail in that spirit of bold and courageous defiance which marked the career of other martyrs, they should remember that such concealment was enjoined upon the missionary labourers in England as their only hope of supplying their scattered flocks with the ordinances of religion and thus keeping alive the spark of Catholicism in our country. Priesthood was the very crime for which they were condemned, and it was part of their missionary duty to cast the onus of proving it upon their persecutors. The usual false witnesses were brought in to testify against him, 
but no one was a match for Father Wall's skill as he demolished their testimony. Even the judge was impressed and remarked to Father Wall that he had a nimble tongue and wit. However, the jury found Father Wall guilty and the judge pronounced the usual death sentence given in these cases, that he was to be hanged, drawn and quartered, disemboweled, his entrails burnt, his head cut off, his body to be cut into quarters and his quarters to be all at the king's disposal. On hearing the sentence, Father Wall said aloud, Thanks be to God, God save the king, and I beseech God to bless your lordship and all this honourable bench. The judge was impressed with Father Wall and postponed the carrying out of the execution until he knew of the king's further pleasure. While he was in prison awaiting death, Father Wall wrote a detailed account of his trial, and this has been preserved to this day. He was sent to London for a brief time and was held in Newgate Prison. There he was confronted by Oates and others who hoped to prove his involvement in the pretended plot. However, Father Wall was more than able to defend himself from his accusers. Father Wall's brother, William, now a Benedictine priest and known as Dom Cuthbert, was also being held in prison on the same false charges at the same time. Sadly, however, the two brothers never met. In due course, Father Wall was returned to Worcester. He wrote a letter to a friend in which he said, The greater the injury and injustice done against us by men to take away our lives, the greater our glory in eternal life before God. This is the last persecution that will be in England. Therefore, I hope God will give all his holy grace to make the best use of it. Prophetic words indeed, as it was the last persecution. The death sentence was carried down on the 15th of August, 1679, the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was to die for his priesthood, unless he took the two oaths and conformed. Father Wall refused and was told he would die on the 22nd of August, the octave day of the Assumption. One of his friends, a Franciscan priest, was allowed to visit him in prison, and so Father Wall was able to receive the sacraments before he died. He wrote a beautiful letter to his superior, the provincial of the English Franciscan province. The letter is translated by Father Cam, and it's worth quoting in full. Reverend Father, this is the last act of my duty which I shall ever be able to offer to your paternity in this world. I shall have been long in the other world before this letter comes into your hands. But this will make it clear that, according to my bounden duty, I begged the blessing of you, my father, before I suffered, and also pardon for all my negligences and faults, both of omission and commission, from the very first moment in which it was my happy lot to be admitted into the ranks of this seraphic order, and to be numbered amongst the brethren. Moreover, I beg pardon of all my dearest brethren, whom I have offended by word or example. One day only of my life remains to me after writing this. These times were so evil that they removed from me all possibility of writing to you, nor did they allow me, or anyone else on my behalf, to give an account to your paternity of my condition. How I have been captured, imprisoned and condemned to die. For the space of nine months I have been imprisoned as a child in the womb, and now that the nine months have elapsed, I hope that my mother, the Church, will bring me forth to God, and that I shall enjoy light perpetual. 
I was taken and thrown into prison a day or two before the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And on this next Friday, which falls on the octave day of the Assumption of the same Blessed Virgin Mary, I am to be released from the prison of this world. So I trust that I may be a partaker of this blessing. Nos cum prolipia benedica virgo Maria, which translates, May Mary Virgin bless us with all her dear children. Meanwhile, I ask God of our seraphic father, Francis, and of your paternity, pardon for all my faults and negligences, and saluting your paternity with the respect that is due to you, and my brethren and sisters with cordial affection, again bidding farewell to you all and to this world. I remain your paternity's servant and son, for the Joachim of St. Anne. On the 22nd of August, he was drawn on a sledge to the place of execution, not far from Worcester Castle. The Catholics saluted him as he passed, and he imparted the blessing to them. At the gallows, Father Wall was allowed by the sheriff to preach a last sermon without interruption. Father Combs' booklet then describes the closing scene for us. The jailer, who had mounted another ladder and had adjusted the rope around the martyr's neck, now spoke to him. Sir, please give the sign when you wish to be turned off. But he replied, I will give no sign. Do it when you will. Our martyrs always refused to give such a sign, lest they should seem thus to hasten their own deaths. St. John now closed his eyes and prayed silently, and almost immediately afterwards the jailer descended, and with the assistance of his satellites removed the ladder and left him suspended in the air. After he had hung for a very short while, his body was cut down, and the remainder of the barbarous sentence was carried out. Whether the martyr was then already dead, we are not told. After being disemboweled, his body was quartered and his head cut off. He died in the 60th year of his age and the 29th of his religious profession. His last words in his speech, as he wrote it in prison, may be quoted here. Convert, O Lord, our captivity as streams in the south, that those who now sow in tears may reap in joy. And for this temporal debt of blessed Trinity, give me eternal life. Let my body die to the world for the love of thee, that my soul may live forever and live in thee, my God. Amen. Sweet Jesus. Amen. Father Wall's debt was mourned by Catholics and Protestants alike. Indeed, the book relates that the sheriff and the multitudes wept at his death. The sheriff's wife lamented and said that she could liken herself to no one but to Pilate's wife and desired her husband to leave that office. Before we leave, let us say a few words about our martyr's brother, William. He was tried at the Old Bailey not long after his brother's execution but acquitted of any involvement in the Oates plot. He was tried again on suspicion of being a priest and found guilty. He was sentenced to death, but he was granted a, repri a reprieve by the king. On the ascension to the throne of the Catholic King James II, he was set free and became one of the king's chaplains. He returned to his monastery when King James was deposed in the 1690 revolution and he died in 1703. This episode of the history program was researched and presented by Frost Solanus for Gate of Heaven Radio. We hope you have enjoyed it and will join us again next month for another episode of 
the history programme. For more information on Harvington Hall, there is a website, www.harvingtonhall.com. That's www.harvingtonhall.com. Ave Maria.